Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another Wednesday evening virtual Bible study from the New Hope Baptist Church in Covington, Georgia. We greet you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray and hope you had a great day. We did, and we're just happy to be able to come and share with you once again tonight uh, to bring you another hopefully stimulating and informative and inspirational Bible study. Today is Wednesday. It is um, April the 21st. And uh, thank God uh, today. I uh, want to wish uh, Shante and Cameron a happy birthday. My, my daughter and grandson, both of their birthdays are today. And, uh, and they're having a great day. Praise God for them. Listen, a lot going on. Uh, most of you know that yesterday the um, jury found uh, Derek uh, Chauvin, uh, the uh, police officer, former police officer who killed George Floyd, they found him guilty on all counts yesterday. And so we are praying that this will be a first step in a uh, series of uh, police reform, of um, some equity as far as justice is concerned in our nation. And listen, even as that was going on, uh, just an hour, a couple hours before, a couple of minutes really before that was happening, a young, a young girl, 16 years old, I believe her name, let's see, I want to get, make sure I get her name right, name, uh, Makaya Bryant, was shot and killed in Ohio, and I believe her, it was either yesterday or today, Andrew Brown was shot and killed in uh, Elizabeth uh, Town, North Carolina. I believe I have the, the, the city right, but I know it's in North Carolina. Uh, both are killed by police, and both black. So we have a lot going on and uh, a long way to go. But hopefully, we are praying that God, God's will will prevail and that justice will be uh, served in all cases. Listen, I was just thinking today, as I watch the verdict on yesterday, uh, I saw people rejoicing, saw people shouting, saw people crying. And I thought about it, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame that, you know, it came to that, that we're at a place in this country where when, 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 a white police officer is prosecuted and convicted of killing a black person. We're at a sad place when we have to rejoice or, or feel relieved or be thankful to God that justice was served. That, that should, first of all, killing shouldn't be happening like that in the first place, what happened to George Floyd. But when they do, it shouldn't be out of the ordinary for the person responsible uh, to be prosecuted, uh, but uh, that's the way things are. But nevertheless, God is still good. We're praying for the Brown family in North Carolina. We're praying for the Bryant family in Ohio as they deal even now with these recent tragedies. They've lost loved ones as a result of police shooting and mass shootings are still going on, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's we listen. If there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying, and I'm, and I'm not talking about saying your prayers. I'm talking about sincerely praying. If there ever was a time, that time is right now. Well, listen. I talked with uh, Brother Brandon Epps, good member of our church today. He called me and wanted me to inform you, those of you who are in the Covington area, Covington and Conyers area, that there are plenty of vaccine, there's plenty of vaccine available at the Ingalls Pharmacy on uh, Salem Road. That's across from the uh, Food Depot on Salem Road. Plenty of vaccines, vaccine uh, available. So if, you, if you're looking for a place, you had a hard time trying to get scheduled, uh, to receive your vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. Plenty of vaccine is available at the 
Ingalls Pharmacy on Salem Road in Carnegie. That's across from Food Depot. And listen, COVID-19 is still out there. People are still getting sick. People are still dying. So we need to do what we can to mitigate the spread of this virus. We, we, it's, been, it's been over a year now. We've been uh, living this new normal. We've been doing these video virtual uh, Bible studies for over a year. And uh, so let's do what we can. And even after you have your shot, uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, continue to maintain your social distancing. Continue to wear your mask. Uh, now is not the time to relax and go back to business as usual. We're still monitoring things, looking at the numbers, um, and we're still contemplating and praying about when we will re-enter uh, for in-person fellowship at the church. Uh, but I just don't think now is the right time. And so, uh, let's continue to do what we can. The more people are vaccinated, uh, the more the virus is mitigated, uh, the more quickly we can get back to some semblance of uh, normalcy. All right, now, uh, tonight, we want to remind you also that we are praying for our own sister, Eloise Duncan. Eloise Duncan. Uh, Eloise's brother, in the person of uh, Reverend Joseph Moon, passed the other day, and his uh, funeral service is scheduled for Friday evening at 7 p.m. at the um, Phillips Mortuary in Social Circle. That's at the Phillips Mortuary in Social Circle, and uh, that service is scheduled for 7 p.m. I think they're going to have a visitation just prior to that service. So let's continue to lift our Sister Eloise up in our prayers. We're also praying for uh, Theodosia and Melissa, the Thomas family, as they deal with the passing of their uncle, Samuel Thomas, in uh, Mississippi. We're also praying uh, for the Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Credit's family in New Jersey. We're praying for um, Melanie. Uh, Brig, Briggs uh, in Conyers, good friend of ours who lost her husband, Deacon John Briggs. I believe he's a deacon at Pete's Chapel Baptist Church. And so we're lifting them up in our prayers. I want to remind you now that uh, we're still doing the Thursday evening uh, prayer call in. Let me just pull that up on the screen for you so you can see the information. So every Thursday, we're still having our New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. So every Thursday from 7 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's uh, from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the number for you to call is 774-220-402. Two and the access code is three seven two one one three seven, followed by the pound sign. That's three seven two one one three seven, followed by the pound sign, and that number to call is seven seven four two two zero four zero two zero, and uh, we. Certainly thank God uh, for what he's been doing with that prayer ministry. So we're praying tonight for all those situations I mentioned earlier. Earlier, We're praying for uh, Sister Eloise Duncan's family and the Moon family in the, in the um, Monroe and Social Circle area. Uh, we are praying for the family of, let's see, we're praying for the family of um, Mikhail Bryant. In Ohio, Andrew Brown in North Carolina. And all those have been affected by the mass shooting of late. And we're still praying for all of the people who have uh, who are victims 
of the COVID-19 virus, those who have contracted the virus, some are even now in the hospital on ventilators. We're praying for them. We're praying for their families. We're praying for their doctors and their caregivers. We're praying for their nurses. Then we're praying for the families of those uh, who have died as a result of the virus, that God would comfort them as only he can. Well, look, let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and then we will begin with our Bible study for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you uh, for this another Lord's Day, a day that you have made. We, we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for your keeping power. We thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy. Father, now we come, we ask that you forgive us of our many sins, our sins of omission as well as our sins of commission. We ask, oh God, we, you forgive us of our sins of even in thought. Forgive us, oh God, that we have not measured up with the standard you have for us. Father, help us as a human family to be more loving and kind to one another. And to remember that where, whatever our ethnicity, whether we're black or white, Asian, Hispanic, that we're all of one blood. We all come from one source that in the human family, we are sisters and brothers. Help us, oh God, to internalize that fact and live it out in our lives so that we might treat each other with compassion and humanity. Now, Lord, we lift up those who were mentioned earlier, those families that are going through bereavement those families who have a loved one sick, those families of God who had a loved one taken from them in such a tragic manner. It's a result of police shooting, mass shooting, even individual violence, individual acts of violence, whatever the situation may be. We know God, there's a bond in Gilead. In Gilead. We just pray now that you just comfort him even right now. Look down on the Thomas family, the Bryant family, the Briggs family. Lord, just continue to bless the Moon family, the Duncan family, whatever other family standing around the graveside. Just comfort them as only you can. We'll be careful, God. Give you all the honor and we give you all the glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. Listen, tonight we're going to share uh, another interesting Bible study. And as we share tonight, I want you to have an open mind. Encourage you to look at the scriptures for yourself. So often, what we take to be true is not necessarily true. So tonight, we're going to take a look at uh, Job. We're going to take a look at Job, and I want to. I want to. I want to talk about. Uh, the fact that the devil is not in Job's details. The devil is not in Job's details. And this is a study of the Satan or the Satan, as, as it's pronounced in Hebrew, in the book of Job. Now, we've all heard the expression that the devil is in the detail. 
And that expression is an idiom that refers to a catch or a mysterious element hidden in the details, meaning that something might seem simple at first look, but it will take more time and effort to complete than expected. In some details we have ignored or perhaps not even considered. Here's what I'm talking about. Some of what we think the Bible says and teaches, the Bible does not say or teach. For instance, I'm sure you've heard this, and I've heard, I've been hearing it all my life as a, as a child and a young Christian growing up. I've always heard that repentance is being godly sorrow for your sins. What I've, uh, that's what I've always heard, that repentance is being godly sorrow for your sins. And when I've heard that, people say, well, you know, the Bible says. Repentance is, is being godly sorrow for your sin. That was the definition I learned as, early, as, as a beginning Christian. That is the definition I learned for repentance. But that is not what the Bible, that is not what the Bible says. Look, let's look at that text. And the, this is, I'm just going to give you two examples of how we've always assumed what the Bible says but the Bible does not say it. Uh, that's found, that, that saying comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. And I'm gonna read what the Bible says. This is in, from the King James Version. This is Paul. He says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Notice what Paul says. He did not say, as we say, Paul did not say, the verse does not say that godly sorrow is repentance. He says, godly sorrow worketh to repentance, or worketh repentance. In other words, he's saying, godly sorrow leads to repentance, or godly sorrow promotes repentance. But there is a difference between godly sorrow and repentance. Godly sorrow does not equal repentance. Godly sorrow leads to Repentance. The sorrow is a, is a feeling in your heart and in your mind. You feel sorry. You're, you're sad. You you know. You feel remorse. Repentance is an action. You actually change your mind. You actually change what you're doing. So that feeling of remorse should lead to change. But they're two different things. But you know we learn that the feeling was repentance, but it's not. The feeling, godly sorrow, leads to repentance. Let's look at another one that's, that's very common that we hear, that people say God says or the Bible says. Well, you know, God won't put no more on you than you're able to bear. You know, we've heard that so many times. God won't put no more on you than you're able to bear. Well, that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13, and let me read that for you. Again, this is Paul. He says, there hath no temptation. Now, when you see that term temptation in your, in your um, New Testament, it has two meanings. Temptation could mean uh, a temptation like some, you know, a, 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 um, you know, trying to get you to do evil. But it also means trial, affliction. Okay? So it can have, it can have both meanings. He says, there's no temptation. So 
we're gonna we're gonna put that trial on. There's no trial. There's no burden. There's nothing that can happen to you, he says, but such as common demand. In other words, nothing strange can happen to you. Everybody goes to it. He says, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted or to be tried above that you are able but with the temptation, make a way to escape that you may be able, ye may be able to bear it. Listen, here's the problem with what our, what our common saying. Here's the problem. We say, God won't put no more on us than we're able to bear. That's not what this verse says. God, the verse is saying, whatever, whatever happens to us, Whatever trials we go through, whatever temptation we face, God will give us the strength and God will provide a way for us to bear it or escape it. The verse does not say that God is the cause or the author or that God puts these stuff on us. See, our, when our little common saying, we, we're, we're implying that God put this on us. And God, put, God ain't going to put them on you. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, uh, James, and I got that James chapter 1, verse 13. It says, let no man, when he's tempted, say he's tempted of God. For God doesn't tempt anybody with evil. Okay? So, actually, when we, when, we, when we do that saying, we are saying something that God does not do. God does not put afflictions upon us. But when afflictions do come, God provides us grace the strength to deal with. So that's just two examples of some common sayings that we just assume, most of us have just assumed are scriptural or in the Bible, but they are not. And so I want to suggest to you that some of our theology, and when, I'm, when I use the word theology, it, theology I'm just talking about uh, what we think about God, our thoughts about God. Uh, some of our theology comes more from folklore in church tradition than from the Bible. For instance, <laughs> this is going to shock you. Did you know that angels do not have wings? Nowhere will you find in the Bible where it talks about angels having wings. Now, I know you're thinking about Isaiah chapter 6, you know, but read that text carefully. It's talking about seraphim. And seraphim are in a different class of spiritual beings than angels. Seraphims are not angels. They, they, they are they are heavenly beings, and they're charged with guarding the throne of God. Guarding cherubim, cherubims and seraphim are not angels. Now, if angels had wings, you could always tell an angel when you see one. But then if you could tell an angel just by seeing it or seeing the angel, then what sense does that scripture make? It says, be careful how you entertain strangers, for sometimes you entertain strangers, the angels unaware. Every time you see an angel or you uh, read of an angel in scripture having an interaction with, with humanity, that angel looks like a regular human, human being. No wings. Another thing uh, is heaven, heaven as a final destination as our eternal destination. Uh, I see it all the time on, you know, I work in the funeral industry, see it all the time on casting, going home. But if we read the Bible carefully, we will see that heaven, place where God dwells, where our deceased loved ones who love the Lord are now in a disembodied state, we see that is not their final, that will not be their final state, nor will that be their final destination. We read in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, 
about a new heaven and a new earth and about new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And we read about that in the end, the final situation will not be us going to be with God, but rather God coming to be with us. So I just did that to give us a precursor and to kind of like prime us uh, to be able to accept the fact that perhaps what we have been taught or what we, you know, uh, thought was in the Bible or thought the Bible meant may not necessarily be what the Bible actually said or actually says or what the Bible actually means uh, as far as what God is saying. So let's 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 dive into this. Let's look at the overlooked details in the book of Job. Now the ironic thing is that while the expression the devil is in the details applies to the book of Job, when one looks at the details of the book of Job, one discover the devil is not in Job's detail. Now I know that sounds like a like a like a puzzle. Sounds like I just said two opposite things, but hopefully at the end of the study you'll see what I'm talking about. But to put it blank, put it plainly, the Satan in the book of Job is not the Satan, many have traditionally, traditionally thought, preached, and taught. Let me say that again. The Satan, the character of Satan, uh, in Job, particularly we find him in Job chapter one and in Job chapter two, is not the Satan we think he is. The Satan in the book of Job is not the Satan of the New Testament, otherwise known as the devil. The detail we will discover is that the devil is not in the book of Job. Let me say that again. We will discover the devil is not in the book of Job. Now, this is how our Bible reads. And I have here three versions. I have the King James, English Standard Version, and the New Revised Standard Version. And they all read similar. King James says, and I'm reading uh, Job chapter one, verse six. It says, now that there, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The ESV puts it this way. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Practically the same thing the uh, King James said. The New Revised Standard, slightly different. Uh, instead of saying sons of God, they say heavenly beings. One day the heavenly being came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And this is basically how most, uh, with some slight variations, how most English Bibles render Job chapter one, verse six. But I want to introduce you to two other texts, two other versions that I think are really more closer to what the Hebrew text is actually saying. And that's the complete Jewish Bible and Young's uh, literal translation. The complete Jewish Bible says it happened one day that the sons of God came to serve Adonai and among them came the adversary. 
Young, Young's literal translation says, and the day is that the son, that sons of God came in to station themselves by Jehovah, and there doth come also the adversary in their midst. Now I want you to notice in Jump Street that the three texts we three verses we just read before, King James. Uh, the English Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version said Satan came. In these two versions, the complete uh, Jewish Bible and Young's literal translation, instead of Satan, they say the adversary. Now, the detail is a grammatical issue. The detail is a grammatical issue. You see, the term Satan occurs 14 times in most English versions of Job, primarily in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. You'll find the term, most English Bibles, you'll find the term Satan. If you would count, you find it 14 times. And the Hebrew term, which is also transliterated as Satan, that's how it's pronounced in Hebrew, Satan, occurs, also occurs 14 times in the Hebrew text of Job. Now, the term Satan or Satan, it means adversary or one who withstands, and sometimes it means just to withstand. Now here's the detail. All of the 14 occurrences of the Hebrew term Satan in the Hebrew text of Job are preceded, preceded by a definite article, transliterated as ha in English. Thus is Hasatan. And some in some Hebrew texts, uh, when it's transliterated, it gives it two S, H A S S A T A N, Hasatan. The Hebrew Hasatan is translated into English as the adversary or the Satan or the Satan. However, here's the issue. Here's the problem. Here's what's causing, causing the confusion. The definite article is ignored and not translated or not brought over into most English versions. The definite article is ignored or not brought over into most English versions. Now, I'm going somewhere, so let's, let's go back to school, Grammar 101. You know, it's amazing how the Lord works. When I was in school, I hated English, hated grammar. I literally did. I, always, I got pretty good grades, but it wasn't my favorite subject. But it seems like I, I, I use it more now than anything I ever studied, really, except for, you know, biblical studies and theology. Well, let's look at grammar. Let's look at the, gra the, the grammatical syntax, the grammatical issues of our discussion. Now, we need to understand, first and foremost, that the Bible is literature. The Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, are literature. They were written. Okay. And when the biblical when the biblical writers wrote the biblical text, they were governed. When the biblical writers wrote the biblical text, they were governed by, and they thus followed the rules of grammar applicable to all literature. 
they had, you know, you have to follow the rules of grammar in order to communicate. Ancient Hebrew and Greek literature were and are governed by many of the same grammatical rules that are applicable to English literature today. And one such rule has pertinent to our discussion. One such rule is the rule of the definite article, which states in normal grammatical syntax, the definite article never precedes a personal name. Let me say that again because that's key to our discussion. In normal grammatical syntax, the definite article never precedes or precedes a personal name. For example, my surname, my last name, is Miller. It is not grammatically correct to address me as the Miller. In fact, a definite article in front of Miller would indicate not my name, but rather the function of a person who works at a meal. The person who, that's where the name really literally comes from. The person who works at a meal is a miller. Now, some of you uh, are named Smith. The name Smith, it, 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 you know, it came from the craft, blacksmith. Copper Smith. So if I said the Smith, if I need to go to town to see the Smith, then you would know that I'm I, I'm going to town to see somebody who's going to craft. You know whether he's a blacksmith or a whatever, copper smith, whatever. But you you would know I'm not going to see John Smith because I would not refer to John Smith as the Smith. See. Therefore, now, don't, 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 don't let me lose you. Therefore, the presence of the definite article before the word Satan or Satan in the Hebrew text indicates not a personal name as most English versions erroneously suggest, but rather a title or function. So if we were to properly read Job, as it is written in the Hebrew, if we were to properly read it, translate it over into English and read it properly, it should read something like this, because like I said earlier, everywhere you see the word Satan in the book of Job, in the Hebrew, there's a definite article before it, it's the Satan. So, for example, the first conversation that's recorded in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, should read like this. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and the Satan, or you could say, or and the adversary, whichever one, because the term Satan literally means adversary but it's the Satan or the adversary also came among them. The Lord said to the Satan, from where have you come? The Satan or the adversary answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to the Satan or the adversary, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then the Satan or the adversary answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. 
And the Lord said to the Satan or the adversary, behold, all that he has in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So the Satan or the adversary went out from the presence of the Lord. You see what's happening there? Everywhere the word Satan is in the book of Job, it is there's a definite article. So if we were to translate it properly, instead of saying Satan did this, it should say the Satan did that. We're not talking, Satan in the book of Job is not a personal noun or personal name, it is a title. Now, lest you think I just thought of this on my own, uh, let me call some witnesses. And I have some witnesses who, who are more qualified than I am. These are biblical scholars. Uh, David Klein, in the word biblical commentary, writes this. He says, we first note that the definite article appears before the term at each of his occurrences in the book. 1 6, verse 7, that, that BIS means twice. Verse 8, verse 9, verse 12, twice there. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, uh, two times in verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 7, verse 6, 14 times. The definite article appears before each of those. This fact, he says, he continues, prevents us from identifying the figure of the Satan uh, with Satan of, of later Jewish and Christian theology. Although the latter is clearly derived from the former, it would be best to ignore the later development of the figure when establishing the nature and role of the Satan in Job. So what we've done, we, we've taken the Satan in the New Testament and we read him back into the figure in the book of Job. He's saying it's best not to do that because it's not Satan in the book of Job, it's the Satan. Let's see what Carol Newsom said. And, uh, this is from the uh, New Interpreter's Bible, volume four. He says, it is unfortunate that so many translations, including the New Revised Standard Version and the NIV, render the Hebrew Hasatan in Job 1, chapters 1 and 2, as Satan, which is linguistically inaccurate and highly misleading. The word Satan is a common noun, meaning accuser, adversary, and is related to a verb meaning to accuse to oppose. Here, where the noun is accompanied by the definite article, it cannot be understood as a personal name, name, but simply as the accuser. To read back into Job 1 and 2, the much later notion of Satan the devil is seriously to misunderstand the story of Job. Let's look at what Marvin Pope said in the uh, Yale Anchor Bible, the Anchor Yale Bible. He says, the Satan. He says, note the definite article. As in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that's where you find the term Hasatan again in the Old Testament, which shows that the term is a title and not yet a proper name. The figure here is not the fully developed character of the latter Jewish and Christian Satan or devil. Okay, so David Klein, Carol Newsom, Marvin Pope all agree. The definite article makes a difference. Have one more here, Dr. Michael Heiser. And he's, this is coming from his book, Demons, What the Bible Really Says About the Powers of Darkness. 
He says in biblical Hebrew, the definite article, the word the is a single letter. Ha. Huh. Transliterate into our English H. Uh, the definite article, as its name suggests, makes an otherwise common name, such as noun, uh, I mean man, more specific, more definite, like the man. English puts the definite article before noun to make uh, to be made definite. Hebrew works the same way, though it directly attaches definite article to a noun, the letter H plus the noun. So we have the noun, okay, the Satan. Hebrew is also like English in that as a rule, it does not tolerate the definite article to precede a proper personal name. He goes on to say, by rule of Hebrew grammar, a noun preceded with a definite article is not a proper personal name. The Hebrew lemma, lemma Satan, occurs 27 times in the, Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, 10 of which are without the definite article. Without exception, every rendering of Satan as Satan in English translations of Job 1 and 2 and Zechariah 3 as the definite article. The term should therefore not be rendered as a proper personal name in those passages, passages presumed by English readers to be critically important for the doctrine of the original rebel of Eden, that is Satan. This was mean, this mean, this would mean that we don't have the serpent or the devil in New Testament language in Job 1 and 2 and Zechariah. The correct translation of Satan in these famous scenes is the adversary or the accuser. So there are four biblical scholars writing on the same point. So now, if this is not the devil in Job 1 and 2, who is it? Well, John Harley says, and this is from his uh, 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 commentary on, on the book of Job in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament. John Hartley says, the sons of God, uh, Hebrew is B'nai Ha Elohim, are the celestial beings or angels whom God created as his servants, as his servants. On this day, they came and presented themselves as courtiers to give an account of their activities to God. One interpretation of the setting of this scene is a session of the council of God. At its sessions, the council of uh, the sons of God reported on the activities and received new orders. On this occasion, the Satan also came among them. Here, the Hebrew word hasatan has the article. So it, so it functions as a title rather than as a personal name. There's a Hebrew term that means to oppose that law. And on the basis of this, some scholars conjecture that the Satan uh, may, that may be the pros prosecuting attorney of the heavenly council. If this view is correct, his task on earth was to discover human sins and failures and to bring his findings before the heavenly assembly. Was the Satan one of the sons of God? The majority of scholars assume that he was. And Driver Gray understands the preposition among, uh, among uh, to indicate that he had a prominent place in this assembly. Of course, there are some who disagree that he was not one of the sons of God and that he was an intruder. But I tend to agree with Hartley and with uh, Driver Gray that he was a part of the uh, divine counsel. So, who is the Satan? Let's let's reference Carol Newsom again in her commentary on the Book of Job. She writes, 
elsewhere in the Old Testament, the word Satan or Satan is used to describe both human and heavenly beings. He cites 1 Samuel 29 and 4, 1 Kings 5 and 4, and verse 18, Psalms 109 and 6. As heavenly beings, you can find that in uh, Numbers 22 and 22, and Zechariah 3 and 1. So elsewhere in the Old Testament, the word Satan is used to describe both humans and heavenly beings who act as adversaries or accusers. The context may be personal, legal, or political, but in each case, the noun simply defines a function. It is likely that by the early post-exilic period, when the book of Job was probably written, the expression the, the Satan had come to designate a particular divine being in the heavenly court. One whose specialized function was to seek out and accuse persons disloyal to God. The chief evidence of this is in Zechariah 3 and 1, who described the heavenly trial of the high priest Joshua, who is standing before the angel of Yahweh with the accuser, the Hasatan, standing at his right hand to accuse him. And that is, you Satan him. There's the noun again. Some scholars have speculated that the figure of the accuser in Zechariah and Job may be modeled on officials in the Persian court who served as informers or the eyes and ears of the king. And even as agents, uh, uh, as agents of uh, provocateurs, although this is less certain, there is an ambiv ambivalence in the relation between the relation between Yahweh and the accusing angel that is important for understanding the, the development of this figure. The accusing angel is a subordinate of God, a member of the divine court who defends God's honor by exposing those who pose a threat to it. In that sense, he is not God's adversary, but the adversary of sinful and corrupt human beings. Yet in Zechariah 3, 2, Yahweh rejects the accuser's indictment of the high priest and rebukes the accuser instead. In Job 1 and 2, Yahweh and the accuser take opposing views of the character of Job as one who embodies and perfects uh, uh, the function of op opposition. The Satan is depicted in these texts as one who accuses precisely those whom God is inclined to favor. In this way, the ostensible defender of God subtly, subtly becomes God's adversary. This is from Carol Newsom. Now I have here cited some more instances of where the name or the term Satan occurs in the Hebrew Old Testament. We don't see it in our English version because in these particular passages, they translate the word Hasatan or Satan as adversary. Translated as adversary in these passages, but in Job, they translate it as Satan and make it a personal noun, personal name. But let's look at uh, in Numbers 22 and 22, and also in verse 32, this is a story where um, Balaam is, you know, was asked to curse, uh, asked Balak, Balak to curse Israel, you know, when the donkey refuses to go forth. And so the angel of the Lord is a Satan. This word is used, is applied to the angel of the Lord in Numbers 22 and 22 and 32. He is a Satan to Balaam. Simply means the angel of the Lord was an adversary to Balaam. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 14, the Lord raised up Hadad, the Edomite, as a Satan adversary to Solomon. 
you read adversary in your English text, but the word behind adversary in your English text is the Hebrew word Satan. Same word we find in Job, but only with Job there's a definite article. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 23 and 25, it says the Lord also raised up a uh, rezon, the son of Eliha, Elada, as a Satan, an adversary to Solomon and Israel. So we find this term, Satan, sprinkled in places in the Old Testament. But we don't see it. The average Bible reader, reader does not see it because it's translated as adversary or some place, places accuser. Now here's an interesting text here. In First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 21, verses, uh, verse one, it says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. You'll find the parallel text in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, where it says, and again, the anger, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Now, in the Hebrew text of 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, there is no definite article preceding the term Satan, but it is still it is still not a proper personal name. Because when we look at the context of that passage, and you got you got to read First Chronicles. You got to go back up and read First Chronicles chapter twenty, verses one through eight, the whole the whole preceding chapter to get the context. You see, the context reveals that David was besieged by a series of wars with the Philistines. And this pressured David to ascertain his military strength since the census, see, the census was actually not a count of all the people of Israel. It was not a count of the general population, but rather it was a count of the number of men who drew the sword in Israel and Judah. In other words, it was a count of the military. You can see that in uh, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse five. It wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't counting everybody. David, since he was besieged by these Philistines and, and these countless guerrilla war incidents, he's trying to figure out how strong he is. Military. Now, the problem with that is that he was supposed to depend on the Lord and not on his military might. He was supposed to, he was supposed to depend on the Lord and not his military might. That was the problem. But now, Chronicle says Satan stood up and provoked Israel. Samuel says the Lord, or Yahweh, moved and provoke David to number. Well, who did it? Was it the devil or was it the Lord? I want to suggest it was neither one. Because when we consider the context of the text, I think the New English translation is closer uh, to relating the true message of the Hebrew text. And if we were to read First Chronicles, chapter 21, verse 1, in the New International, or the New, I'm sorry, the New English Translation, the Net, it says this. It says, an adversary opposed Israel, inciting David to count how many warriors Israel had. Remember, I just said it didn't have a definite article. You know, so when you don't have a definite article, you don't necessarily, you don't automatically assume it's a person now, but you apply an indefinite article. A, 
on an adversary, an adversary. Doesn't specify which one, but the adversary. Now, this is what the, the notes of the uh, New English translation say about it. It says the parallel text in 2 Samuel 24 and 1 says, the Lord anger again raised against Israel and he incited David against them saying, go count Israel and Judah. The version of the incident in the book of 2 Samuel gives an underlying theological perspective while the chronicle occurs simply describes what happened from a human perspective. Many interpreters and translations uh, render the Hebrew term as a proper name, proper name here, Satan. And then she gives a couple, several who do that. And she says, however, she says, however, the Hebrew term, which means adversary, is used here without the article. Elsewhere, when it appears without the article, it refers to a personal or national adversary in the human sphere. The lone exception being Numbers 22, 22 and 32. Uh, that's where we talk about the angel of the Lord functioning as an adversary to Balaam. Balaam, we just read that a few minutes ago. So in light of the past of the, of the uses elsewhere, the adversary in 1 Chronicles 21, and one is likely a human enemy, probably a nearby nation whose hostility against Israel pressured David into numbering the people so he could access or access or assess his military strength, which is what we just said. So let me conclude with this. We, we, we're, we're just about finished here. This is the Old Testament Satan summary. These are the facts you need to remember. And I, I want to encourage you now. I mean, you know, we may have gone a little fast. We didn't read all of the scripture. I want to encourage you to go back over the video, pause, take time to read the scripture. I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see it for yourself, pray, ask God to give you the spirit of revelation so that you can see this for yourself, because this is a radical concept from what, you know, from what we've always heard. But I, I believe this is what the Bible is actually saying. So let's summarize. The term Satan occurs 27 times. Satan, you'll find that Hebrew term 27 times in the Hebrew text. Now, when we talk about the Hebrew text, we're always talking about the Old Testament. Old Testament written in Hebrew, most, but basically in Hebrew, you got a little Chaldee in Daniel, but the, the majority of the Old Testament, the overwhelming majority is Hebrew. But whenever you talk about the Hebrew text, automatically think Old Testament. If you say, if you say the Greek text, you think New Testament. And of course, there is a Greek translation of the Hebrew called the Septuagint, uh, where it is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. In 19 of the 27 occurrences, the Hebrew term is translated as Satan in the King, in King James Version. So of those 27 times, the term Satan is in the Hebrew text. 19 of those times, the King James translators translated the word as Satan. Seven times they translated as adversary. One time they translated as the stand. In every occurrence, in Job, and there are 14 of them. In every occurrence in Job, the term is preceded by a definite article. In other words, as you read your English Bible, every time you see the word Satan in Job, it is the Satan, the Satan, the Satan. 
In fact, in order to get the true uh, meaning of what, of what the text is trying to say, perhaps you should not even say the Satan, you should say the adversary or the accuser. The term Satan appears three times in Zechariah. That's in Zechariah chapter three, verses one and two. Each time, those three times in Zechariah, it is preceded by a definite article. So in Zechariah, we, we have again the, the Hasatan showing up, the Satan showing up, the accuser, the adversary. It appears once in First Chronicles 21 and 1 without a definite article. We just talked about that. And David numbered Israel. So here's my concluding thought. Based on a careful study, this exegete, that's, that's a fancy word of saying me, this exegete has concluded. Not only does the devil not appear in the book of Job, but no Old, Old Testament occurrence of the term Satan is a reference to the devil. I'm suggesting that not only is the devil not in Job as a Satan, I'm suggesting that not only is the devil not the Satan and Job, everywhere we find the word Satan in the Old Testament, it is not a reference to the devil, it's a reference to something else. It is a reference to an adversary or the adversary. Either a human person is an adversary or a member of the divine council. as in Job. Therefore, whenever the term Satan is found in the Old Testament English version, the reader should think, as I just said, the adversary or adversary if there's no definite article in Hebrew. Of course, now you won't know that because as, I, as we started this study, the problem is the English version in the English translation, they ignored the definite article. So you wouldn't know if there's a definite article. But, but, but if you were to read the book of Job, every, every occurrence of Job, every occurrence in Job of the word Satan, and the three occurrences of, of the word Satan in the book of Zechariah, all of them are preceded by a definite article. It should be the accuser in every case. In Job, in all the cases in Zechariah. And you want to do that because you don't want to make, as we've all done, traditionally and historically, and many continue to do, make the theological misstep of assuming that the Satan of the Old Testament is the same as the Satan of the New Testament. Two different concepts. They're using the same name in English, but if you were to study the Greek, study the Hebrew, there's a difference. Every occurrence in Job is not a reference. No occurrence in Job is a reference to the personal devil we think about that tempted Jesus in the wilderness. No, this is a different Satan, a different being with a different objective. And you say, well, Pastor, what difference does it make? The difference it makes is that when we study the Bible, in order to ascertain what God is saying and the message of the text, we must accurately know what God said through the biblical writing. And the problem in most cases is that we end up, we end up putting our tradition, church tradition into the text. We read, we, we read into the text from our perspective, 
instead of trying to investigate and find the perspective of the biblical writer. And we've all done this. We all do it. And we have to guard ourselves against doing it. And I think it, start, it started, as I said before, in another Bible class. It started back in Sunday school when everybody had to get up and said, well, little Harold, what does this verse mean to you? And my point is this, my friend. It does not matter what the verse meant or means to me. What really matters is what the verse means. And the only way we can find out what the verse means is we've got to look at that verse from the, from the context of the author or the speaker or the original audience and not our own. Amen? Well, listen, I hope this uh, lesson has been uh, a blessing to you. I know it was a little theologically heavy, but I think it was important that we discuss this because there's a lot of stuff in the Bible uh, that we just take for granted. Uh, that we, we, in some of the teaching and preaching we hear, uh, don't line up with scripture. But we put our own spin into it instead of what the Bible is actually saying. Well, listen, share this video on your timeline with your family and friends uh, on Facebook. Uh, let them see what's going on. And hopefully they too will be um, increased in knowledge as you have been. Follow us, uh, if you will. And listen, uh, tomorrow night, 7 p.m., uh, call in on the prayer line, and we'd love to have you come and share with us on that uh, medium also. Well, God bless you, my friend. It's been a joy, and I bid you God's peace. And listen, be prayerful. Remember, you can do more on your knees with God than with any man standing up. Until next time, may the Lord bless you. Real good is our prayer.